There is a fundamental principle of object-oriented code design, single responsibility. It states that your classes should have only one reason to change, a human reason. That is, if you or one of your teammates look at it, they can only think about one main reason for it to change. It doesn't fit the system based on the responsibility of the class. Let me clarify that for you with a concrete example. Here is a scene that doesn't have much in Godot. It's the ledge detector from our Metroidvania. But that's a good example of a class that has one clear responsibility. So here's the code. It detects ledges using two ray casts casting horizontally. If one ray is in a wall and the other is in the air, it means the node is near a ledge. So this is a component that can use with other nodes to make your character, when you code character motion, can make it detect ledges. And in the Metroidvania project, this is what happens. You hit a ledge and the character will climb on top of it. But the ledge detector itself does one thing and it does it well. It detects the ledge and it can tell another node whether or not it is currently against the ledge. So if we look in the editor, it can be a bit hard to see while well, the ray casts. So when I code a new node like that, a new class, the first thing I do is at the top, I write this doc string. I put three quotation marks and in the middle, I will describe what my node, my class, my scene is supposed to do. Note that in Godot, what you consider a class, this can lead your scripts in Godot, your GD script files, to being quite short, quite small. Here, 50 lines of code, which is not a lot. This principle doesn't make your classes actually small. It can make them pretty big. The thing is, when you see 50 lines of code here in Godot, it's actually a position 2D with two ray casts. And if you were to look at the source code in the Godot engine itself, these are pretty big. They might have hundreds of lines of code to make them work. Then if you really think about it, if I look at my player here that has lots of nodes and scripts attached to it, well, this entire scene, this structure that you can see on the left is one class. And at the same time, these elements, the hook, the ledge detector that we just looked at, the floor detector, the wall detector, each of these is also a class in itself. It's just that the player is a big one that aggregates other scenes. So you can think both as of the ledge detector as a class, a single one with a specific responsibility, and the player is a really bigger responsibility, but still a single one. The player is just the class that represents the player in the game. So it can do lots of things. It can move, it might be able to swim, to climb ledges, to use the hook, etc. But still, it does have a single responsibility conceptually. So anyone working on the game will, when they think about anything related to the player, they will know that they can come on this class. And the main reason for it to change is, well, we need to add that behavior because it's something that the player should be able to do. Even if there are lots of behaviors in the class, we use a state machine down there to manage them. So you can run, have air movement, wall uh, movement, you can slide and jump on the walls. You have a state to climb on the ledges, to use the hook, etc. When you try to write decouple code and you use things like a state machine, your classes using the single responsibility principle might lead to having really short scripts, each doing something really specific, really focused. It doesn't have to be the case. Here's an other example of a player. This is from our um, Good at Three course. So I'm going to open the player scene. And if we look at the script there, it's actually pretty long. There again, the responsibility of the player is kind of the same. It's over 200 lines of code. The difference is instead of breaking it down into many nodes, making it an aggregate, in the course, we try to show how 
you can sometimes use tricks like these, like using an, a num, to code all the behaviors in place. And if you don't have too many, if your game is simple enough, this can be a good way to create your character quickly. For example, when you participate to the Ludum Dare, a game jam. But still, the responsibility of the class is fairly clear. The player represents the player and has all the movements, the animation, etc. that we need to give feedback to the player, to process their input, etc. to have the gameplay work, essentially. What would break that principle, right? What's an example of something you shouldn't do? Here's an example I see really often. You have the player that should represent the behaviors of the player, and you have a variable like that, like score, okay? The score should not be on the player. The, the score is not a representation of the player, it's the player's performance in the game. It's a, a rating that should be in a separate place, right? The score, you would want to put it in a score class, basically, something like that. You wouldn't even want to put it on the user interface, but really on a different class or node that would manage the player's score, maybe the leaderboards, like a list of the scores, the various players who played the game had with the ability to save that to a file to um, return all that data so you can save it to a file. The problem with putting the score on the player node in this case is that when you want to change things related to the score you have to think oh I have to go look into the player for when it doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense if you start to say the player manages the score, the, the player updates the score. You know, it's not the player that does that. It's, it's really the scoring system. It could be the game itself, right? So that this single responsibility principle ties back into having your code make sense as well. It's each object that you create when it performs an operation, if I say the player character or the character in the game can walk, it makes sense. If I say it can run and jump, it makes sense. And that's a good rule of thumb to see if you are respecting that principle. But if you start to tuck the score inside here and to manage the user interface, the player updates the user interface or updates the life bar. Now you don't want to, to do that. The life bar changes itself. The life bar updates the life bar drawing on screen, for example. That would make a bit more sense and have a clear separation of concerns between the player node and the life bar itself. When you apply this principle, you are aiming for a code base where your teammates, when they think about where do I go to change the score or the user interface, in the player class that would be hard to find, that would make the code mingle together, that would make it hard to track, that would make it so when several developers have to change something in different systems in your game, so the user interface, the score and the player, if you poorly design it, if you break the single responsibility principle, they will work on the same file as well, possibly producing merge conflicts when you start to merge everything with your version control system and way worse, producing bugs, those kinds of things. That's it for this informal introduction to the principle. It's one I really wanted to cover, even if it's not done in the absolute best way, we can always make a better video in the future. You will find links to go further in the video description. I highly recommend that you check them out. But that said, I want to thank you kindly for watching. Be creative, have fun, see you in the next one. Bye-bye.